There is an ideology that invisibly dominates almost every aspect of our society. It seeps into every nook and cranny it can find, from the cities to the countryside, from our jobs to our homes, from our schools to our political system, and even into our relationships with each other and with the planet. It burrows down into the deepest values we hold, such as freedom, dignity, and choice, and uses them to its own advantage. This ideology has gripped us so tightly that its logic has become intertwined in our own conventional wisdom. You may have never heard its name before, but this ideology is real, it is dangerous, and it is finally being exposed. This ideology is neoliberalism. What is neoliberalism? There are many ways to answer that question. You can call it a philosophy, a movement, a political project, or even a set of social values. In its most basic form, however, Neoliberalism is an economic ideology that exists within the framework of capitalism. When observed at its philosophical origin, neoliberalism appears as an absolutist mantra that proclaims that a government or state must never intervene in any market or economy, even to provide welfare for its citizenry, lest it put society on a slippery path towards socialism and totalitarianism. The market, which is the wellspring of human freedom, must be allowed to operate free of any constraints or regulations, Anything less is to diminish the freedom of all human beings and place civilization in enormous peril. Practically speaking, neoliberalism refers to the various ways in which our society has elevated competition above all other conceptions of economic rationality, retasked the state with liberating competitive markets, and put increased responsibility onto the private individual to guarantee their own survival. Neoliberalism conceives of the world as one big interconnected competitive market, where human beings derive their freedom from their ability to express their preferences through consumption and represent their value through their ability to sell their labor for wages. Since all people enjoy equal access to and opportunity within this competitive market, inequality between winners and losers is permitted. And because neoliberalism asserts that there is an unbreakable link between economic and political freedom, neoliberalism seeks a world with unfettered economic freedom, which would naturally guarantee political freedom for all. Therefore, according to neoliberalism, the predominant role of government should be to maximize economic freedom, no matter the cost. That might sound to you like a strange way to organize society, and you'd be right. But we live in a world that's been dominated by neoliberalism for close to four decades. Beginning in the late 1970s and early 1980s, most of the countries in the world transitioned from the old economic paradigm, one that had been operating mostly successfully since the late 1930s, to a new economic paradigm, specifically a neoliberal economic paradigm. This transition, sometimes referred to as the market turn, was no less than a revolution in economic and political thought and brought very dramatic changes to society. And yet, one of the most fascinating elements of neoliberalism is how its ideas, its rise, its ensuing power, and even its very existence are still unknown to most people today. Ask anyone you know, even someone who seems particularly attuned to politics or economics, and they will likely struggle to define neoliberalism for you or recall much of its history. In a society that's been neoliberal for as long as ours has, this is extraordinary. As a columnist of The Guardian, George Monbiot has astutely observed, living in the United States, the United Kingdom, or virtually any other country on earth without knowing what neoliberalism is, is akin to living in the Soviet Union without ever having heard of communism. You might still be fuzzy about what exactly neoliberalism is, but you have doubtlessly seen many examples of it in your own lifetime. Do you sometimes wonder why grocery stores often throw away food that could easily be given away to the hungry? Do you ever wonder why spikes on the ground are considered a solution to homelessness? Do you often wonder how it is possible to have incredible displays of wealth and opulence alongside abject and desperate poverty in the same community? And do you ever get the strange feeling that the economy, and by extension our roles as consumers, have been clandestinely placed at the center of our moral and political universes? If you do, then a close analysis of neoliberalism and its history will likely shed some insight into those nagging suspicions. In neoliberal societies, the only remedies to social problems considered politically palatable are the ones that rely on the market to deliver the solution, even if that solution doesn't actually solve the problem. The reason why excess food isn't given to the hungry is because the right of a private company to sell groceries at a profit is elevated higher than a vulnerable human being's need to eat. The reason why we place spikes on the ground to disperse homeless people is because we value the rights of property owners and businesses to be free of uncomfortable eyesores more than we care for the plight of property-less people. The solution for these vulnerable people, the argument goes, is to simply pull themselves up and engage in the market to get what they need. For the government to step in and provide affordable housing to the homeless 
or to give food to the needy, would be unfairly diverting profits from private businesses who only recognize humans as consumers. And the government can't be allowed to help the vulnerable, the argument goes, because to do so would inculcate dependency in the population and lead to greater and greater encroachments of the state. You can probably think of more examples of neoliberal capitalist logic the longer you try. Have you ever wondered why the idea of raising the minimum wage is so controversial? Because wages for workers and laborers are seen as a cost to be minimized, not as an investment in human prosperity or even as a basic requirement of doing business. Why is the idea of taxing the wealthy so controversial? Because neoliberalism asserts that people are wealthy because they simply work harder, work smarter, and are more virtuous. Taxation is seen as stealing from those who have earned and handing out to those who haven't, rather than as leveling a playing field that offers the well-off incredible opportunities to compound their wealth from the beginning of their lives. Why is the government viewed as a perpetual enemy of the market? Because the government's moral contract with its citizens enables it to regulate and restrict the market's ability to trade or speculate recklessly, thereby protecting consumers and limiting the potential profits of businesses. Why is the average American's default mode of transportation a personal vehicle instead of public transportation? Why don't we have universal health care? Or why don't we make internet connectivity a local utility? Why do we allow charter schools and private prisons to exist? Because companies don't want local or federal governments providing cheap, useful services that can be privatized and profited from instead. Why do the wealthiest individuals on the planet own more wealth than billions of other people? Why have the wages of working and middle class people stagnated for almost 40 years? Why are the costs of basic necessities and opportunities for social mobility rising out of attainability? And why are our political systems now approaching complete disorder and unresponsiveness at the same moment that corporate profits and wealth inequality are at their apex in recent history? These are all natural questions to ask in our neoliberal society. But for many of us, they're made taboo, or even imperceptible, by a normalized culture of economic absurdity that we've been immersed in for so long that we don't see anything out of the ordinary. The only way to break this spell is to re-examine our history and recognize how we arrived at our contemporary moment. The rise of neoliberalism in recent history is at once a vast and overwhelmingly complex phenomenon, but also relatively easy to summarize the more you know about it. The problem is, most people have never even heard of the word neoliberalism. And without careful definition, it's even more difficult to see it in the world around you. And before we get started, no, this has nothing to do with partisan affiliation for one party or another. As we'll see, neoliberalism is a deeper framework for society that both major parties in the United States, liberals and conservatives, subscribe to to differing degrees. Let's start with the word neoliberalism itself. Neoliberalism simply means new liberalism which means there is also an old liberalism that we ought to be familiar with before moving forward. In the aftermath of World War II, the United States and its allies began the reconstruction of Europe and other parts of the world with a basic economic plan in mind. The emerging states would all turn towards liberal democracy, and their economies would focus on achieving full employment, economic growth, and the welfare of their citizens. The most important detail, however, was that state power would be used to intervene in, or in some cases completely substitute, markets. These policies were called Keynesian, named after the major British economist John Maynard Keynes. They rose to prominence in the 1930s following the Great Depression and were the basic prescription for all liberal economies following World War II. The world before the Great Depression in many ways resembled the world today. Income inequality was high, the notorious robber barons enjoyed powerful monopolies over entire industries, and Wall Street was cashing in on the Gilded Age. But all of that came to an end in 1929 when the stock market crashed and the entire world was subjected to an extended economic depression that changed global attitudes towards unregulated economies. What the Great Depression taught the world was that economic collapse caused by unregulated markets could destroy the chances for a better life promised by democratic society. Therefore, governments were forced, by popular discontent, to grapple with the issue of government-regulated economies, and turn to economists like Keynes for answers. Keynesian economic policies, represented by the New Deal under U.S. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the development of robust welfare systems under Prime Minister Clement Attlee in the U.K., created the backbone of what most of us today consider a fair economy. The government would regulate markets by setting standards for wages, work hours, and welfare systems such as health care and education. In some cases, the government would break up monopolies or take over entire markets to prevent them from falling or becoming privatized. This was thought to be a class compromise between capital and labor, and was generally advocated as a necessity for domestic peace and tranquility. Capital, 
represented by the employers, the business leaders, and creditors, could still do business and make profits, while labor, represented by employees, workers, and consumer advocates, could lead prosperous lives thanks to their healthy wages, benefits, and social services. The other, more well-known half of liberalism was that society would be run democratically. Citizens would enjoy rights of free people, such as the right to speak and associate freely, to find dignified work, to elect representatives to public office, and to be free from arbitrary government oppression or corporate exploitation. This combination of liberal democracy with an economy monitored and regulated by the government is what is known as embedded liberalism, meaning that market and corporate activities are constrained by a web of regulation which prevents them from exploiting labor and acting recklessly in pursuit of profit. In the realm of politics, embedded liberalism was often referred to as the post-war consensus, referring to the way most countries in the world adopted embedded liberalism during the Reconstruction after World War II. In the United States, embedded liberalism came after the period of classical liberalism, which had a laissez-faire or leave-it-alone approach to the economy, and contributed to the conditions leading to the Great Depression. What makes neoliberalism the new liberalism, therefore, is that neoliberalism formally unshackles itself from the government regulations and interventions of embedded liberalism, unleashes the rapid expansion of markets and corporate activity, and undoes the Keynesian safeguard for labor, and with it, the basic guarantee of a decent life for many normal people. Neoliberalism is different from classical liberalism in that rather than simply taking a laissez-faire or do-nothing approach to the economy, neoliberal states actively construct the policies and infrastructure necessary to create unregulated free markets by design, markets which the government must create but never interfere with. Because neoliberalism is so opposed to government intervention in the market, neoliberals are sometimes referred to as libertarians, which is an umbrella term that encompasses varying degrees of skepticism towards the state's mandate to govern. Many of the early neoliberals were described as libertarians, conservatives, or even laissez-faire liberals, but the truth is that they were articulating a brand new framework for society that tasked the government with actively reorienting society around the market. As Daniel Stedman Jones has observed, the term neoliberal likely didn't catch on in our culture because it was lacking context. The terms liberal and conservative that we assign to our political parties today emerged out of the New Deal era, with supporters of the New Deal becoming liberal and opponents becoming conservative. The central confusion surrounding neoliberalism, then, is that the term itself appears to resemble liberalism, but in fact has much more in common with post-New Deal conservatism, in that neoliberalism is fundamentally opposed to the New Deal and in economic intervention by governments in general. Though neoliberalism initially found its home in the American and British conservative parties, neoliberalism would eventually dominate both the liberal and conservative parties in the US and the UK, demonstrating the misleading nature of our traditional political labels and our collective failure to properly identify the neoliberal movement during its ascension. In this multi-part video series, we're going to trace the history of neoliberalism, starting with a close analysis of neoliberal thought and philosophy, a historical reconstruction of the movement pushing for neoliberal policy solutions, witnessing the damage that neoliberalism did to its first victims in the developing world, and then charting the infiltration of neoliberalism into the political systems of the United States and the United Kingdom. We'll then analyze how neoliberalism spread internationally and created the global political and social dysfunction we now find ourselves confronting. There are potential solutions to neoliberalism, but we can't understand what those are until we understand the history of neoliberalism itself. The origins of neoliberalism extend as far back as the late 1930s, and the success of neoliberalism was the fruit of decades of work by neoliberal academics and advocates in a group called the Mont Pelerin Society. From its inception, the Mont Pelerin Society sought to exert covert influence over society and achieve an unassailable neoliberal consensus in the academic and political arenas across the globe, making neoliberalism the invisible ideology that it is today. By producing mountains of neoliberal policy solutions through their transatlantic network of university departments and policy think tanks, these neoliberal thought leaders and businessmen, such as Friedrich Hayek, Ludwig von Mises, Milton Friedman, George Stigler, James Buchanan, Anthony Fisher, Leonard Reed, Harold Luno, and many others, laid the foundation for a counter-revolution against Keynesian embedded liberalism that finally came to fruition almost 50 years later. That neoliberalism completely displaced the post-war consensus by the late 80s is a testament to how committed these men were and how unprepared the rest of the world was. Today, 
Both the US and the UK are prime examples of neoliberal states in a late stage of their development. The neoliberal revolutions in these countries took place in the late 1970s and early 1980s, beginning in the administrations of Jimmy Carter in the US and James Callahan in the UK. In the midst of the stagflation crisis of the 1970s, Carter and Callahan both turned to monetary policies advocated by Mont Pelerin members such as Milton Friedman to reduce inflation and unemployment. Though neoliberalism found its first openings under the control of liberal parties, it was their conservative successors, Margaret Thatcher in the UK and Ronald Reagan in the US, who took the neoliberal baton and ran so far with it that no administration since then has walked back the neoliberal consensus in either country. The unfortunate truth is that no one really tried to, either. The liberals who took power following Thatcher and Reagan, Tony Blair in the UK and Bill Clinton in the US, simply accepted the new normal of neoliberalism and abandoned their party's historic roles of protecting labor from capital and protecting society from monopoly power. This is why people often make the imprecise claim that both parties are the same. There are still many important differences between them, but enduring support for neoliberal economic policies is not one of them. The adoption of neoliberalism in powerful countries like the US and the UK influenced countries around the world to follow suit, making the path to neoliberalism in these two countries particularly crucial to understanding the spread of neoliberalism across the globe. But before neoliberalism was adopted in developed countries like the US and the UK, it was imposed by military force on developing countries such as Iran, Guatemala, Indonesia, Brazil, Argentina, and Chile in order to protect American business interests and to gather experimental data for neoliberal economists in the US to test their assertions. Military coups backed by the CIA took place in each of these countries, and the neoliberal economic policies which were adopted soon after were accompanied by the deaths, torture, and disappearances of hundreds of thousands of innocent people who were targeted for their political opposition to these regimes. When neoliberalism came to the developed world, there was no need for violent coups, but the resulting changes in society led to a different kind of oppression. Even when the suffering brought on by military dictatorship was taken out of the picture, neoliberal economic policies created suffering through the imposition of austerity, inequality, unemployment, incarceration, and poverty on normal people, and human needs for social solidarity and stability were submerged in a new world of ubiquitous competition, commodification, loneliness, and disconnectedness. The peaceful adoption of neoliberalism in the developed world didn't put an end to others being coerced into it, however. International lending bodies such as the World Bank and International Monetary Fund, created at the beginning of the post-war consensus, were converted to neoliberalism in the 1980s, and subsequently began converting countries all over the world to neoliberalism through the process of structural adjustment policies in response to financial crises. Only recently has the IMF reconsidered its allegiance to neoliberalism after decades of touting its economic infallibility. But what exactly is neoliberal economic policy? How does it change or modify the economy and society? The economic route taken by neoliberal regimes is reflected in a policy playbook that's been seen reproduced around the world over and over again. Neoliberal economics, otherwise known as free market economics, relies on the simultaneous implementation of multiple different methods of economic shock treatment, as writer Naomi Klein calls it. Neoliberalism shifts the primary goal of economic policy from achieving full employment to the reduction of inflation, and therefore pursues contractionary monetary policy over fiscal policy. These policies tightly control the supply of money being printed by the government in order to keep the real value of the currency high, to keep prices stable, to increase interest rates, and therefore increase returns on loan repayments from debtors, and to deprive the government of money to spend on Keynesian interventions. Far from being a small technical detail, the shift from targeting full employment to inflation is what marks the death of embedded liberalism and the arrival of neoliberal regimes in almost every instance. Neoliberalism calls for deep budget cuts to government spending, even if that spending is devoted to crucial social services or welfare programs, which is also known as austerity. It also calls for the privatization of state-owned industries and services, which will later be privately operated or simply sold. It calls for the suspension of fixed price controls and exchange rates, the removal of tariff protections for local industries, and the suppression of labor's right to collectively bargain for improved work conditions. These goals are often accomplished with a combination of domestic legislation and international free trade deals such as NAFTA or the recently scrapped Trans-Pacific Partnership which encode trade liberalization, the outsourcing of cheap labor, and corporate supremacy over government regulations into the DNA of their partner nations. Essentially, 
Neoliberalism calls for the removal of any regulations or legislation that impede the aspirations of multinational companies and corporations and of the politicians who inevitably benefit from serving them. The logistical purpose of these policies is to create a playground for private capital to invest in and profit from. Decreasing federal budgets for education, healthcare, and housing, and the accompanying privatization of those industries, forces people to pay private companies for crucial or even life-preserving services, companies that can easily raise the prices of these services and escape punishment for doing so. Removing tariffs means opening the economy to foreign investment and flooding the market with cheap foreign imports that crush local businesses, increasing unemployment and poverty, and sending money out of national circulation and into private pockets. Neoliberal economics also cause a substantial growth in debt due to the combination of tax cuts and military spending, which are often two major priorities of neoliberal regimes, or the acceptance of structural adjustment loans from the World Bank or IMF, who then collect the loan repayment and interest from the national government, but not the private companies who spent the money. Fixed price controls, fixed exchange rates, and labor's ability to protest these conditions are obstacles to maximizing the returns on these investments, and so are removed. The practical result of these policies is an enormous redistribution of wealth from the public sector to the individuals and companies providing these new private markets who represent a convergence of corporate and political power. The line between politicians and wealthy business people is often blurred in late-stage neoliberal capitalist societies and can be accurately described as a power elite that views the population it is meant to serve as a captive and untapped market that can hold debt and risk but receives no relief in the form of government spending, bailouts, or basic compensation for labor. The military and police are strengthened, and then used to protect the power elite and their property if they experience resistance. And when these private interests are finished consolidating power, they begin to look for their next global target for deregulation and privatization. These measures are often justified by neoliberal thinkers for their effectiveness at decreasing inflation rates and rapidly increasing global growth and GDP output. But these measurements are not measurements of human flourishing, but merely of economic performance in a global economy that fewer and fewer people are participating in as time goes on. Some neoliberals even claim that their free market policies later led to the emergence of free society in historically oppressed countries around the world, or that the wealth of neoliberalism's primary beneficiaries trickles down to everyone else. And some even characterize the term neoliberalism itself as an epithet devoid of meaning or unrepresentative of neoliberalism's true form. These arguments are deceptive, and history has shown that neoliberals will suffer any human cost to defend the free market from government intervention, which they insist is the only source of human freedom there is. Today, the consequences of decades of neoliberalism in countries around the globe range from soaring inequality, devastating financial meltdowns, deepening political corruption, growing authoritarianism, and even amplification of the effects of climate change. In 2017, the richest 1% of the global population held 50.1% of the world's wealth, while the poorest 50% of the global population held just 1%. The global economy can be said to have technically recovered after the most recent financial crisis in 2008, but upon closer scrutiny it becomes apparent that the large majority of this recovery went to the wealthiest in our society, leaving vast numbers of people in financial precarity or outright poverty. Those responsible for the recession were not punished, but lavishly rewarded. These economic crises are now being compounded by political and cultural crises. Fascist and white nationalist organizing has been revitalized by people dispossessed by decades of neoliberal economics who have become susceptible to despair, hatred, and authoritarian sloganeering. These movements are given strength by cooperation with wealthy backers who use fascist movements as a vehicle for their own neoliberal policy goals, such as further tax cuts or deregulation. Our federal government, captured by private interests it is meant to regulate, is drowning in dark money and completely unresponsive to popular demands. Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton, who worked to preserve neoliberalism in the Democratic Party, helped create the necessary conditions for the election of Donald Trump, whose victory can be explained by, among many other factors, the failures of the Democratic Party to admit its complicity in the operation of neoliberalism and to construct a party platform explicitly opposed to it. While Trump and the Republicans are arguably more neoliberal than the Democrats, they were able to harness the populist tide born from disdain with the status quo that Clinton and the other neoliberal Democrats represented. Democratic Socialist challenger Bernie Sanders could have siphoned that support from Trump, but was denied by the neoliberal wing of the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party, which first flirted with neoliberalism all the way back in the Carter presidency, was left holding the bag of neoliberalism while the most scandalous candidate in history got away with the presidency.
In the absence of a strong and uncompromisingly pro-labor and anti-neoliberal alternative, national politics will continue to grow increasingly vicious and unhinged from reality. The standard neoliberal prescriptions of deregulation, privatization, austerity, and incarceration will continue unabated. Our new politics of xenophobia will produce more border walls, travel bans, deportations, gun violence, violent terrorism, racial and ethnic discrimination, and military aggression that will continue to weigh on the lives of everyday people. And global society will continue accelerating towards a world where fortresses of otherworldly wealth seclude themselves from vast wastes of decaying public spaces. And yet, all of these national crises distract us from still more perilous global crises. Earth's global temperatures and the rate of carbon concentration in the atmosphere are being exacerbated by runaway harvesting of enormously profitable yet non-renewable natural resources, threatening the long and short-term habitability of the planet. Rising sea levels threaten to trigger migration crises that will make Syria look like an opening act. On the approaching horizon, technological advancements such as automation and the development of powerful artificial intelligence threaten to blindside societies still struggling with the ancient problems of inequality and poverty rather than liberate us from our traditional lifestyles. The most frightening consequence of neoliberalism, however, is simply that as we continue to march further into this complicating and confusing morass of crises, unpredictable and unintended catastrophes will occur with greater and greater frequency. I intend to argue that all of these threatening conditions derive from the widespread acceptance of neoliberal economic thought across the world. But how could an ideology based on nothing but ensuring the dominance of markets over government come to envelop the entire world? This video series is the story of that transformation. This is neoliberalism.